The world that we live in now is dependent on the choices that our forefathers and foremothers made on our behalf. Right? So the ways in which we imagine the worlds that we live in and the worlds that we build shape the worlds that we build. That's, that's the point. So in the first lecture, we talked about the Anthropocene, the uh, idea that um, mankind is now so powerful as a force of nature in itself shaping the world in which we live on uh, in ways which are ultimately dangerous to our own survival on the planet. So we talked about the need, especially in the second lecture, about transitioning to what we called a safe and just space for humanity, uh, so we've called living within the donut, as shown here, where we stay within the planetary limits that are set for us, but also we maintain standards of, uh, which provide a decent quality of life for everybody on the globe. Now, with regards to climate change, we talked about how the two-degree target that was agreed upon at the Paris conference in 2015 um, is a limit uh, which could be represented as a planetary boundary, and the idea is that we can't go over that because we, to do so would be to risk disrupting in, in very significant ways the Earth system that we depend upon. And we looked at how, in order to stay within that two degrees target, there is a very, very tight carbon budget about how much carbon we need can burn between now and in the future. And the longer we delay cutting our emissions now, the faster and harder and more difficult it becomes in the future. And so we need to get to zero emissions as quickly as possible. Right? So that's what we looked at in the second lecture. And we discussed the fact that in order to do so, it requires transformation transformatory change of our energy systems, of our transportation systems, of our food and agricultural systems, and most importantly, perhaps of all, our financial system. And so the conclusion of the second lecture was that we need systems change in order to tackle climate change. But that if we do change the systems that we live within and operate within, we can create a better future for all of us. Okay. So that leads us to a conundrum, a problem, which is why, if it's so urgent to act and that we can create a better world through acting, are we not acting on the scale that's required? All right. And I like this cartoon. Um, it's a scientist. <laughs> standing at the podium of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in 1990, and he's saying, so, this climate change thing could be a bit of a problem. And five years later, in 1995, he's saying, climate change, definitely a problem. 2001, yep, we should really be getting on with sorting this out pretty soon. <coughs> in 2007, look, sorry to sound like a broken record here, 2013, we really have checked, and we're not making this up, and 2019, tap, 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 is this thing on? Of course, this is ridiculous. It's a, it's a farcical. But I think it does represent a common misunderstanding about the way that many people, including scientists in particular, have about the issue, which is that the reason that we're not taking action on this is because we haven't explained it properly. We haven't convinced people of the facts and the need to change. And I don't think that's true. So... What we've seen over the last 20, 30 years or so, over my lifetime, is that emissions have continued to rise increasingly, right? So the first, the IPCC was founded in 1988. James Hansen, the climate scientist I talked about, in the, he sp spoke to Congress in the United States in 1988 saying climate change is a real and present danger. And yet, over that period of time, we have emitted more emissions in the last 30 years than the entire history before then. So we're clearly not taking action. So there's some kind of barrier, a blockage to, to that. So what is that? And I think if you dig into it, the reason we're not taking action is because of the power of vested interests. Now, in particular, the fossil fuel industry, but also many of the other large industries that depend on that fossil fuel industry. So if you look at, there's a series of really fascinating articles carried out by Inside Climate News and the LA, LA Times, where they, they basically went through decades' worth of documents from 
fossil fuel industry, in particular ExxonMobil, who is the world's largest fossil fuel producer. Um, and what they've shown is that very early on, in the 1970s and early 1980s, ExxonMobil's own scientists were looking at the climate change problem. And they said at the time that climate change was a real risk. So this is a quote from one of those documents saying that there is no doubt that increases in fossil fuel usage and decreases in forest cover are aggravating the potential problem of increased CO2 in the atmosphere. So they knew this, right? This was all internal documents that were shared between the higher-ups of, of, of ExxonMobil at the time. And yet, as this video shows, they chose not to do anything about it. Well, because well, I feel like this is a talk. That ExxonMobil Corporation is under a lot of scrutiny right now um, on at least five fronts. We've got the Attorneys General of Massachusetts and New York. We've got the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, not to mention some of ExxonMobil's own shareholders and employees. Basically, they're all asking roughly the same question. And that's, has ExxonMobil in the past, through the way it's communicated about climate change, misled its customers, its shareholders, or the general public? About a year and a half ago, there were several articles published in the Los Angeles Times and Inside Climate News that discussed the question of what ExxonMobil knew about climate science back in the 70s and 80s. And these articles showed that, in fact, there was substantial evidence from internal company documents, not only that ExxonMobil was quite aware of the emerging science, but actually had contributed to it and had a research program uh, looking at some aspects of the problem. Exxon has um, responded by, by arguing that these claims are entirely false. It said um, that the journalists have deliberately cherry-picked statements to come to the conclusions that they have. They issued a challenge on their website. They said, read the documents and decide for yourself. So Exxon argues that anyone who takes uh, a deep dive at all the evidence will come to the conclusion that there's, there's been no wrongdoing here. And so my postdoc, Jeff Supran, and I talked about it, and we thought, well, we could do that. We know how to read. Before anything gets sent out. Right. We've read all the documents. We've analyzed them according to established, peer-reviewed social science methods. We're excited about this paper because it's the first time that anyone has published a peer-reviewed academic analysis of the entire 40-year history of ExxonMobil's communication and scientific work on the issue of climate change. Today we're reporting our findings in the journal Environmental Research Letters. So if you're interested in our work and you want to find out more, just follow the links in this video. And thanks for your interest. And if you read the conclusions of that paper, then what do they find? They find that we conclude that ExxonMobil contributed to advancing climate science by the way of its scientists' academic publications, but promoted doubt about it in advertorials. Given this discrepancy, we conclude that ExxonMobil misled the public. And basically what, what the fossil fuel companies, because ExxonMobil was by no means alone in doing this, have been doing is carrying out um, the same kind of tactics as the tobacco industry did in the 1950s and 60s. Basically, at the time, medical establishment had already found and firmly concluded that tobacco smoking caused cancer. But the tobacco industry said, what we need to do is convince the public that, they're not, that we're not scientifically certain about the connection yet. And so there's a famous memo uh, leak uh, that was found when the tobacco industry was sued in the 1990s that basically said, you know, some PR firms working for the tobacco company basically said to them, doubt is our product, right? What we're trying to sell to the public is confusion, is, is that uncertainty in, in, and in order to convince them that the scientific link hadn't been firmly established. Because if it hasn't been firmly established, the public are willing to say, well, let's wait and see, let's just carry on as we are for now. And they knew exactly that they were doing this, right? So this is uh, a Republican pollster, Frank Luntz. Um, it's a leaked memo from the Bush White House, uh, and it was advice that they had asked ba basically about, about this issue. And he said, the scientific debate is closing against us, but not yet closed. There is still a window of opportunity to challenge the science. Voters believe that there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. Should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to make, continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate, which is, of course, what they went on and did. 
it's really black and white, right? And so the thing is, scientists had been sure at that point for you know, over two decades that climate change was being caused by emissions and was going to be a threat. So, so it's, it's kind of using the public's own um, uncertainty against, against them. And the way that they did with this was by creating a vast misinformation machine, um, funneling millions and millions of dollars into think tanks and um, kind of institutes, which would basically then stand talking heads up on television, writing uh, columns in, in the uh, mainstream newspapers and things like that, trying to confuse the public. And this is some excellent work that was done by investigative journalists working with Greenpeace, looking at those connections. And so you'd see institutes like the Heritage Foundation, the um, Competitive Enterprise Institute, the, the Cato Institute, which are you know, big think tanks in the United States who advise uh, governments and put out policy briefs and things like that. And they were then basically given money to ExxonMobil, and then they hired these people who basically said that climate change wasn't the problem, it was a hoax, et cetera, et cetera, and put that into the mainstream. So here's an example of just how those talking heads work in practice. And Mark Morano, if sure. I may, uh, you are implacably opposed to the concept of man-made climate change. Why? We followed the evidence. Uh, there are quite literally hundreds of factors that influence global temperature. Everything from tilts of the Earth's axis to ocean cycles to water vapor, methane, solar system, the sun, cloud feedback, volcanic dust. The idea that CO2 is the tail that wags the dogs is not supportable. The global warming alarm spread by Al Gore and the United Nations is in utter scientific collapse. If you look at the, the satellite data, uh, we, we actually have had no significant warming uh, since 1998. Actually, no warming. We've been cooling in recent years. Now we've gone 16 years without global warming, according to the UN data. They're failing on their predictions. Sea level, not only is it failing to accelerate, it's actually dropped uh, a year or two ago, and, it, and it's showing no signs of acceleration. Global temperatures have flattened out 10, 15, 20 years, depending on the data source. Uh, you go through polar bears, they're at or near historic highs. Cholera, malaria, Mount Kilimanjaro, all the stuff Al Gore warned about isn't coming true. This has now reached the level of the Mayan calendar in Nostradamus when it comes to science. This is now akin to medieval witchcraft, where we used to blame witches for controlling the weather. It's no better than in 1450 when Aztec priests encouraged people to sacrifice uh, to, the, to, the, to the gods to end the drought. Every time there's a bad weather event, the global warming activists think we need more taxes and regulations to somehow stop bad weather. This is a primitive form of science. We call it subprime science. The whole movement has collapsed. It was shown to be subprime science, subprime economics, and subprime politics. This is about the United Nations getting wealth and getting the management of uh, the developing world and as much of the developed world they can get their hands on. A global environmental organization that's going to be able to police the world. This is stuff Orwell couldn't conceive of. Your home energy use, your travel, your train travel, airline travel, all monitored by international agencies. It's not the stuff of science fiction. This is a level of control that George Orwell didn't contemplate. He who controls carbon controls life, and I will add to that with the Rio Earth Summit coming up. He who controls carbon and controls land use policy and, uh, and, even, the, and even the oceans controls the world, and that's what they're going for. And this isn't conspiracy talk, this is in their documents. So, <clears throat> so that's the kind of thing, right? And, and when you just put up someone like that with all that PR experience and expertise, and typically what will happen is the news uh, channel will just put them against a scientist who's really careful and cautious and scientific about what they're talking about, and they talk about it in kind of a boring academic kind of way, and they just don't have a chance, right? The, the public just doesn't know what to make of that. They don't know who to listen to and, and who's, who's more reliable or anything. And so the, the, if you're living in a news environment where this is happening constantly, it becomes very easy to become confused and misled and just say, look, they don't know what they're talking about. Let's just wait until they do, right? Um, and we see this in the UK as well, right? So it's not just in the US. Um, this is uh, the BBC having to admit, again, that they shouldn't have invited uh, one of the leading climate skeptics in the UK, Lord Lawson, onto the radio to talk about climate change without challenging him uh, on the claims that he was making. Um, and this has happened multiple times now. I mean, he works for the Global Policy Warming Foundation. He's one of the leading climate deniers in the UK. But you see this all the time throughout the British press. You keep seeing stories cropping up. Um, 
the Mirror, now top scientist, says there is no link between global warming and severe weather battering the UK when, you know, the scientists are constantly saying there's links between these things. Uh, 100 reasons why global warming is natural. No proof that human activity is to blame, according to the Daily Express. Um, the Telegraph, global warming at a standstill, new Met Office figures show. Like, so, constantly misleading and putting these, these things into the press. So why is this happening? Why is this uh, debate being distorted in this way? So again, at last week we talked about the carbon bubble, the idea that the uh, oil, and coal and, and gas companies are overvalued uh, currently because um, they have far more fossil fuels on their reserves than can be safely burnt if we're to stay within that two degrees target. And so it's about five times more, right? So these companies are basically valued as though that coal will be dug up and burnt. So in order to protect their business and their business model, these companies need to keep burning and digging up coal for as long as possible, which means delaying action for as long as possible. And that's what they've been doing, and they've been doing it really, really well. And if you listen to what they're saying now, currently, they're saying we're going to carry on doing this into the future. So BP saying 2040, we're going to see continued oil demand growth up until then, and likewise ExxonMobil. Right? So if we do this, there's no chance of sticking to that Paris commitment. We will not stay below two degrees Celsius. And it's true not just for the fossil fuel companies, like I said, but all of their infrastructure that we're building that relies on fossil fuels. So the big utility companies that own power stations building new coal power stations, or, or oil pipelines being built, or gas refineries, or new airports that have airplanes that, that use fossil fuels, right? Everything that we're building now locks us into a future that is heavily dependent on fossil fuels. And so the more that we present ourselves as building that future, and that is the future we're headed towards, the more we lock down onto that, the more we invest into that, the more we construct that. Which brings us back to this quote by Ben Van Burden, the CEO of Shell, which I think really encapsulates very well the points that I'm trying to make. Right? He says, if we are not careful, the broader public support for this sector will wane. This is the biggest challenge as we have at the moment as a company. The fact that societal acceptance of the energy system as we have it is just disappearing. Well, fantastic. That's great as far as I'm concerned. But it's terrible to me that he sees that as a threat, right? He's trying to stop that. And so it brings us back to this quote by Jonathan Rowson that I started with at the beginning, right? The present that occurs now is shaped by how an imaginary future was acted upon in the past. Risk assessment doesn't just represent the future. In altering behavior in the present, it also changes the future that ultimately elapses. Now, what the fossil fuel industry are trying to do is sell you a future. They are trying to sell you an imaginary future. A future that says we will continue business as usual, we will continue digging up oil, coal, and gas, and we will continue building machines and energy systems that run on that. Now, if we imagine a different future, then we can start to try and build it. And that's, I love this quote by Lucille Clifton, an American poet, right? If we cannot create what we can't imagine. Now, if we are not talking about building a future that is free of fossil fuels, then we will not try and build it. We will not start investing in it. And so that's what's happening. There's a war of ideas that's happening right now by the fossil fuel industry. And they're winning that war, if I'm honest. They're saying that we will continue along the business as usual pathway. And yet, we can flip that, right? We can come up with a different imaginary, a different conversation about the future that we are creating, that we are trying to build. And that's the task that we are all engaged in. So, that brings us to our question, the question of the talk, which is, will we change? I mean, there's obviously huge challenges. There's challenges from the status quo trying to hang on to the power that it's got from the way the system currently works. So can we challenge that? Can we change that? And I think it hangs on the idea of tipping points. Now, we, we talked about tipping points in the Earth system in the first lecture, the idea that there are certain points where things suddenly spiral out of control. There's runaway feedbacks that, that kind of small changes suddenly add up to really large changes. 
And I think um, this quote sums up as well that tipping points are not just part of the Earth system, they're part of our own social systems. Right? So the tipping point is that magic moment when an idea, trend, or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips, and then spreads like wildfire. So things go really, really, really slowly, and then suddenly everything's different. Okay. Now that idea is crucial. But to show you that basically before that tipping point happens, it can sometimes seem really, really hard to imagine things being any different to how they currently are. And so I like this story. It's a story about um, what it would have been like to be a tourist traveling in Edinburgh in the 1800s, the 1700s. So Edmund Burt was an Englishman from London. He went up to Edinburgh to see what the city was like. And um, one evening, he was in the, um, he went to a bar, and he was drinking ale, and it was getting to be about nine o'clock at night, and suddenly everybody around him picked up a piece of paper and stuck it in the candle in front of them and started wafting smoke around the room until the room filled up with fumes, and he started coughing and spluttering, and he was like, what on earth are they doing? Why on earth are they filling this room with smoke? And then nine o'clock struck, and everybody in the houses above them emptied their chamber pots onto the street. Right? Um, and then the night sweepers would come along and, and brush it all away uh, before the next day. And the smell from that was just so bad that the pub, would, the pub um, customers would rather sit in a room full of smoke, which they can't smell anything, than to smell the stench coming from outside. And that's partly why Edinburgh was known colloquially as the old Reeky, because of the stench of the city. Now, one of the really interesting things was that Edmund Burt wrote a, a letter back to London about his experiences and about how unpleasant and awful it was. And he said, you know, I racked my brains thinking about what would, could be done about this. And he said, but anything so expensive as a conveyance down from the uppermost floor could never be agreed upon nor could there be made within any bu the building any such receiver suitable for such numbers of people, by which he's talking about toilets. Okay? But I've lived in Edinburgh, and it doesn't smell. <laughs> in fact, there's a photograph of, of the sewage pipes and toilets going down the sides of the buildings. Right? So it, we could do it, but he couldn't imagine that we could do it. Now, in London, at the same time, or a little bit later, there was huge cholera outbreaks from the fact that the water systems there were so inadequate and became polluted by the sewage. And so, so you would have these standing pipes um, where people would go and get their water, and um, they were all contaminated with feces and, and therefore would spread the diseases throughout the populations. And so it became so problematic for the city that they said, you know, we have to invest in a proper infrastructure. And so they dug up all of the streets of London to lay underground sewers. Right? So this is Fleet Street in London. And the expense of this, the, the scale of this transformation was immense, especially given the technologies of the time. And yet, they did it. So when you have the will, when you have the imagination of what can be done, you can do, um, we can do ama amazing things. Another really good example, I think, is this one. Um, so in the late 1800s, um, the streets of London and New York were heading towards disaster. So they had piles of horse manure building up in the streets because everybody was trying to get around the cities. And the cities were getting so large that in order to do so, you had to go by horse and carriage and, and um, uh, horse-drawn cabs. And so the horses defecated in the street as they went by and left uh, more and more and more manure behind. And so people um, were saying, you know, if, if this carries on, if people keep using horses and carriages at increasing rates as they have been doing, then in 50 years' time, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of manure. And this was a, a, a calculation published in the Times, right? And they were so worried about this because it was such a big problem that there was the first uh, international meeting of town planners that happened around that time made it a priority to talk about what to do about this issue. But of course, they couldn't see that just around the corner, the automobile was going to solve their problems. And so this is a picture in 1900 of 
the horse-drawn carriages going down Fifth Avenue in New York on Easter Day Parade. And just 13 years later, this is the same street, same Easter Day Parade, but there's only one horse-drawn carriage in all of those cars. Okay? The transformation happened that quickly. And so you can look outside your own window and you can see all the internal combustion engine vehicles with the petrol and diesel going past your doors today. And you can think to yourself, well, in 13 years' time, it could be that we see instead fleets of electric vehicles and people on bikes and using public transport. It could be. I've seen a few major tipping points in my lifetime. I remember when I was 18, the first pint of beer I went to have on my birthday, going to the pub, and it was horrendous because it was so full of people smoking, and I, I had asthma, and I just couldn't enjoy it, right? It was... It was supposed to be this thing that you did and, and you had fun, and it wasn't fun. And you went home smelling of cigarettes, and it was horrible. And yet, people thought, well, it was just something you had to put up with. It was just the way things were, and people went to pubs to smoke and drink. And yet, it was causing all sorts of harms, especially to the bar staff who had to sit and work in there all day long. And so, it was eventually enough pressure was put on the government to introduce a smoking ban. And since that time, and everybody threw up their hands and said, oh, it's going to you know, ruin, ruin the industry, no one was going to go to the pub anymore, and of course that didn't happen. So that was an example of, I think, a really rapid, radical change in, in mindsets, and people just accepted it. People actually enjoyed the fact that they could go to the pub without smoking anymore. Another example, I think, is, is that of gay marriage. Now, if you'd asked my parents, I think, when they were my age, did they think that they'd ever see gay marriage becoming legalised in this country in their lifetime? I think they would have said no. But it's happened, right? And it's not happened just here. It's happened in most of the United States as well as Australia and, and so on, right? So, so there's been a huge transformation socially about this in a really short period of time. The point being, and I think is really summed up by Nelson Mandela, that it always seems impossible until it's done. And this was something he said after uh, you know, they, they managed to beat apartheid in South Africa. Right? He carried on his whole life fighting this cause that always seemed impossible, but it ended up succeeding. Right? So because it's so hard to sit here in the present and look forward and think, how do we get from here to the future? Let's go into the future and look backwards, right? Let's go 30 years from now and just think, how, think about how old you'll be 30 years from now. I'll, I'll be about 62. And, and here we go, right? And imagine that we have achieved this, right? We, we are now living in a safe and just space for humanity, right? We are living in this future. How did we get there? What had to happen in order for us to get there? Well, I would suggest that what happened is that we triggered a whole load of those social tipping points and that they reinforced each other and sped each other along. So I'm going to tell you a story from the future. Okay. So the first thing that happened <coughs> was that because of the declining cost of solar panel in this future, we saw that the rates of deployment continue to exceed the expectations of the energy communities, right? We just kept on building more and more, faster and faster than anybody had predicted. Until we reached a tipping point. And we reached this tipping point around the 2020s, where it became cheaper to build renewable energy than it was to build coal or gas power stations. And it happened first of all in China and then it, and, and the US, but it started to happen everywhere. And so rather than investing in new dirty technologies, we invested in new clean ones instead. But then we got to a second tipping point, and this one was much more interesting. Because by about the 2030s, instead of investing in um, ex maintaining existing fossil fuel infrastructure, it was now cheaper to close it and build new renewable energy infrastructure instead. And at that point, everything changed. Because rather than continuing to build, uh, to, to keep open 
our fossil fuel infrastructure, it now made sense to close it and close it quickly. But in order to get to that point, the rates of deployment had had to keep increasing. And so it had taken lots of community groups to insist that their schools would have solar panel on their roofs and that their hospitals would. It had taken groups to go outside of Parliament and stick windmills in the ground in order to say, we want more onshore wind farms built in this country. And it took groups like the Campaigns Against the Arms Trade to say, let's shut down those arms manufacturing companies and re them to build wind farms and solar powers, panels instead. And it took workers and business owners and trade unions to go outside of Whitehall and say, green is working. We want more green jobs in this country because that is the future that our young people are going to inhabit. And as those technologies came on in the way that they did, they led to the bursting of the carbon bubble. Now, we talked about the carbon bubble in one of the earlier lectures, and, and we talked about it a little bit again earlier today, the idea that these companies are overvalued, right? So as soon as they start the investors start recognizing that it's not safe to put your money in those companies anymore, then you better get it out quick and put it somewhere else before everybody else realizes that first. And so there's a race to get out of the dirty energy companies. And that was accelerated by the fossil fuel divestment campaigns that were championed by students in universities up and down countries around the world, where they said, we don't want our institutions investing in fossil fuels anymore. We want to invest in our future. And they were supported by faith groups who said, we don't want our churches investing in dirty infrastructure anymore. We want our investments in our future. And along came the trade unionists, and they said, we don't want our pensions invested in that dirty future either, because that's not a safe investment, and it's not building a future for our kids. So we want to invest in a clean future as well. And as this started happening, more and more businesses, more and more countries even, started saying, we don't want to put our money in this dirty infrastructure. We want to, like Norway, invest in our one, million, one trillion dollar uh, um, sovereign wealth fund in the clean future. And people said, we're not going to carry on digging out the fossil fuels in the ground. And so you'd have these mass trespasses of open cast mines around the world where people would go in and they'd shut down the coal power station, uh, the coal, coal mining. You'd have climate scientists like James Hansen who would stand outside the White House and get arrested to try and stop pipelines from being built. And you would have had um, groups of indigenous people saying, you're not going to build pipelines on our land and, and use their rights to defend the earth. And you'd have had elderly people looking out for their grandchildren and saying, as grandparents, as nanas, we're going to fight fracking and stop it from happening in our neighborhoods so that our grandkids can have a safe future. And you'd have had companies like ExxonMobil and Shell being sued by New York and other cities around the world for the damages that they were suffering because of climate change and saying that your continued willful misleading of the public has led us to this pace, and therefore you have to pay for that. And as that becomes apparent, more and more of the um, investors say, these companies have huge liabilities because of these uh, lawsuits, and we're not going to invest in them anymore. And so all of that happened. And so whilst in 2010, the world's, one of the world's largest coal companies, Peabody, was saying, coal's best days are ahead, it was little did they know that within just five years they were going to be bankrupt. And in this world, as the number of extreme weather events continued to increase exponentially because of the climate change that was already locked in, and we saw increasing numbers of cyclones hitting impoverished communities around the world, and wildfires burning through people's homes and neighborhoods, and floods drowning our cities and our livelihoods, and heat waves that were so intense that people would faint in the street and die of heat stroke. 
as that became so common that you could not look away from it, that you could not ignore it, people around the world gathered and said, we need to fight for climate justice. We need to march for a better future. We need to lobby our politicians for a fair and just transition. And they would organize these mass lobbies of parliamentarians around the world and say, we want you to bring laws and policies into place that will take us to a safe future. And the UK became one of the first countries to sign up to saying that they will be, have a zero carbon target. And where countries refused to implement these laws and refused to implement these policies, then the citizens would organize and crowdfund legal campaigns to sue those countries. And Holland was one of the first countries that did this. And it transpired that like every great cause throughout history, that there was a strong core moral demand at its center. Whether it was the votes for women, or the civil rights movement, or the Great Liberation Movement, or the very beginnings of the environmental movement in the 1970s, people recognized that they had to come together in clubs and societies and groups and collectively bring about change. In the years leading up to that first Earth Day, many Americans became concerned about what they saw as unchecked air and water pollution and the destruction of forests and other ecosystems. Dennis Hayes was the first Earth Day national coordinator. In Los Angeles, the estimates were that for simply breathing, it was the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. We had rivers that were catching on fire, lakes that were dying, the American national emblem, the bald eagle, was on the verge of extinction, and, and on and on. The growing anti-war movement of the late 1960s also contributed to the surge in environmental activism. As Earth Day approached, support for it spread. On April 22nd, one in every ten Americans took part in rallies, concerts, educational programs, and cleanup projects. It was to raise a set of issues, to tie them all together into one fabric, um, so that the people who were fighting against pesticides and the people who were fighting to stop freeways cutting through their neighborhoods or fighting against air pollution or fighting to preserve a wetland would realize that they had common values. The public outcry on that first Earth Day led to political action. Congress passed new laws for clean air, water, and endangered species, and created the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Forty years later, the annual observance is a global event, with one billion people taking part in a multitude of events. So one in ten Americans were involved in the first Earth Day. When it came to the climate day, it was three in 10, okay? And that's because, as Bill McKibben, the great environmentalist said, climate change is the single biggest thing humans have ever done on this planet. The only thing that needs to be bigger is our movement to stop it. And that meant recognizing that climate change was not an issue that we'd solve as individuals changing our own consuming beh consumer behavior and changing our own lifestyles. It was an issue that could only be solved through coming together and working collaboratively and collectively to challenge and reshape the systems that we were part of. And so, as I talked about in the first lecture, this movement recognized that climate change was not simply or solely about the environment. It was also about human rights and national security and public health and economics and job creation and development. Climate change and tackling climate change was about all of these things. And so you would have trade unionists come out and campaign for one million climate jobs. And you would have members of the RSPB and other nature conservation organizations come out and defend and fight for the nature that they so loved and cared about. And you have doctors and nurses and other medical professionals come out and say, we need to fight for the global health of the citizens of this planet. And mem members of the Women's Institute would come out and say, we're going to fight for a fair future for everyone. And we'd have members of the Christian movements and involving Christian aid and things like that 
come out and say that the right thing to do is to fight for a clean future. And they were joined by Muslims working with Islamic Relief saying, we will need to fight for a safe future. And the scientists would come out and they would join them and say, we, would need, we need to fight for a safe future. And most importantly of all, this movement was led by young people fighting for their future. And that is what it meant to have courage in the Antipasa. That is what it meant to lead by example and to join forces with each other and to have hope that we could build something better. But at its core, this movement had a simple moral understanding. That understanding was that it was right to save humanity and that it was wrong to pollute the earth and that it is right to give hope to future generations. And so I'm going to conclude with this long quote by Rebecca Solnit. And she says of hope that to hope is to gamble. It is to bet on the future, on your desires, on the possibility that an open heart and uncertainty is better than gloom and safety. To hope is dangerous. And yet it is the opposite of fear, for to live is to risk. I say all this to you because hope is not like a lottery ticket that you can sit on the sofa and clutch, feeling lucky. I say this because hope is an axe you break down doors with in an emergency, because hope should shove you out the door, because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of the Earth's treasures, and from the grinding down of the poor and the marginal. Hope just means another world might be possible, not promised, not guaranteed. Hope calls for action. Action is impossible without hope. And so you ask me, will we change? And I say, it doesn't matter what I think, whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic about our chances of that change happening. What matters is that there is a possibility that we could change things, that things could change in the direction that brings about a better, safer future. And if that possibility exists, then the right thing to do is to fight for that possibility and to try everything we can to bring that about. And so that's what I'm going to try and do. And I'm asking you, in return, will you join me? Thank you.